going to try to stick to the rules tonight for this reason. If this is a success, we want this to go again. The way the world is going, maybe we ought to do this once a month uh, to see what happens. But um, we'll, just, uh, we'll just keep it going uh, as, as needed. But we've got a lot of information to bring to you tonight and a lot of consideration. Uh, as we look at the world events that are taking place in light of Bible prophecy, and we're going to do something uh, very deliberate, and that is we are not going to assume anything, though we want to, we're not going to assume anything that's happening in the world as being the fulfillment in the present tense of Bible prophecy. Maybe some things are being fulfilled. We want to talk about it from what the Bible has to say. If there are things that are being set up and staged, because the Bible talks about it. We're going to talk about those things. We're going to address those things. And if there's some things, and there will be some things tonight that are just not good practice when it comes to understanding the Bible, we're going to be going through that as well. So listen, without any further ado, I want you guys to remember that in this, in this um, attempt to tone down the hysteria that's out there in the world around us and to elevate truth, we want to cite this scripture and remind you of it often. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, the Apostle Paul wrote to them and said, Test all things and hold fast to that which is good. Amen to that? Amen. Hold fast to that which is good. And what is good is the word of God. Well, joining us tonight as our guest this evening is, an, is a Christian apologist. He's an author, nationally, internationally known speaker. He graduated from Biola University cum laude from Talbot Theological Seminary and the International Seminary in Theology of Law in Strasbourg, France as well. He's a best-selling author, award-winning author, and co-author of over 70 books. His various writings have been translated into 30 different languages around the world, and he has sold over 1 million copies of his books. His teaching schedule has taken him around the world in defense of authentic biblical Christianity and our faith. He's heard daily on a nationally syndicated radio show, you guys know that, called Pastor's Perspective, and I wanted to throw this in. He's so smart that just hanging out with him, you can earn a degree. I'm talking about Don Stewart, so welcome Don with us tonight. There he is. Thank you. Well, this side? Very good. All right. Thanks for the introduction. Okay, well, you got it. All right. You guys, none of this is rehearsed, so no. we're warning you right now. How's that? This is about as raw and about as real as you can get. So if you want, if you're a millennial and you want authentic, if you want organic, this is it. Uh, we may be old, but we're organic. Well, you guys, listen, uh, here's the rules. Look at this. I set my timer. We're going we're gonna to take three 30-minute segments. When the alarm goes off, uh, we're going to move on. And so here's the rules for tonight. We're going to talk about, Don's going to talk about, I want to listen to him a lot, but we're going to talk about the doctrine of Scripture, the teaching of Scripture. And we're going to do that for about 30 minutes. And, and uh, we're not limiting it to uh, future things, but then not restricting that. I'm going to ask Don, for all of you who are here, and for those of you who have tuned in, in, the, in this day and age, uh, are there any rules? I'm going to ask Don, I'm going to ask you, are there any rules to Bible interpretation? How can we keep ourselves from going off the edge of crazy the way many people are going uh, these days? And they do it in the name of God. And so uh, that's what we want to start with. Let's talk about Bible doctrine. How do we do it safely? Okay. There's a very simple rule of Bible interpretation. When you read the scripture, if the literal sense makes good sense, then seek no other sense, let you come up with nonsense, okay? <laughs> that's and good. so that's real simple, isn't it, Jack? Yeah. God is a great communicator, and he communicates to the masses. Remember what it says about Jesus, the common people heard him gladly, yeah. Jack? Right. So that means when God spoke, he expects us to listen. And one of the things we'll talk about tonight, at the first coming of Christ, he expected the people to take literally the predictions that were given. In other words, in Luke 24 on the Emmaus Road on the day of his resurrection with these two disciples going there, he basically denounced them because they were leaving Jerusalem on that day. And he said, it was necessary, was it not, for the Christ to first suffer and then enter into his glory. And it said, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them all the things in the scriptures concerning himself. And so the whole Bible is about Jesus. John 5, 39, Jesus said, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. 
they are they which testify of me. Had you believed Moses, you would have believed me because Moses wrote about me. So the whole idea is, the whole scripture is about Jesus, but it's communicated, Jack, in such a way where even a child can understand. My two right. daughters came to Christ, each of them separately, at four years of age, and they understood, and they still to this day understand because the gospel is very simple, isn't it? Amen. And so we read Amen. what we read, you know, if, uh, and that's bottom line. Well, I love the fact, you guys, that uh, Jesus said, I've told you these things in advance, that when they come to pass, you will know that I am he. And of course, the context of that statement yep. is, in, is in the prophetic sense. But I want to I wanna underscore something uh, that if you attend this church, you've heard before. A lot of people have a tendency to push back from Bible prophecy because it's caused a lot of damage in some people's lives. And I actually agree, bad Bible prophecy discussion has led to some damage. Right. When we depart from the scripture, we get into the weeds and things get really strange. But what's beautiful about Bible prophecy is that if you're a Christian tonight, or maybe by virtue of this gathering, you, be, you want to become a Christian. Did you know that the doctrine of salvation, soteriology is the technical term, it is the first prophetic announcement in the Bible. The first thing prophetically announced in the Bible is that God would save mankind through the woman who would bring forth the Savior of the world, Genesis 3. The Bible also says in the book of Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, that Jesus Christ himself is the spirit of prophecy, the revelation of God's word. And so what I'm delighted about and what we want to do uh, tonight is calm the nerves and yet excite your passion for the truth and be stable or grounded in the word of God. So uh, that, that's our desire. And we'll get into some exciting stuff tonight. But um, So if I'm approaching the Bible for the first time, you, you, I, I think you answer that. Just take it literally unless it says otherwise. And, and by the way, the Bible does say otherwise, uh, exactly. right? Uh, when, when the scripture says that it's going to be this, it's this. But when it speaks in what we would say uh, typological uh, uh, language, yeah. give well, us an example for, of that. Yeah, the Bible says the trees of the field clap their hands. The trees don't have hands, they don't clap, but it's talk about nature rejoicing. And so there are many, you know, just like regular literature, you have law, you have poetry, you have narrative. And so the entire Bible is a, a bunch of different types of literature, but it's an, one unfolding story from beginning to end. And like we always say, Jack, context, context, mm -hmm. context. You can tell by the context usually whether something's to be taken literally or something symbolic. But one very important point on this, on the literature that's there. Jack mentioned it here, and this is key, about the salvation message. It's a very simple message that anyone can understand. And the whole theme of the Bible is God and the human race and the person particularly who knows the Lord. And so what we find in Scripture is basically the only things we do find is, has to do with God and how he works with the human race. We have people come on the scene like angels. We have nations that come on the scene, but they're only mentioned with respect to the two main players. It's sort of like a play where you have you know, different bit players in the back or actors coming and going, but the first two seats are God and the believers, the mm -hmm. redeemed people. And so in reading that, we need to understand that God's communicating one unfolding story from beginning to end. The Bible is one continuous story by 40 different human authors about the salvation of the human race. And so what it is, what it's all about, he's trying to communicate in such a way where we can know him, we can love him, and we can follow him. And again, it, it's sensible. I like to talk about sensible Christianity instead of kook Christianity, you know, because it, it's, it's sensible, isn't it, sure, Jack? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. And so when you look at the signs that are there in the world today, when you look at how to interpret the Bible, let it interpret itself. Jesus, again, pointed to some of the predictions that were fulfilled in him, and we take his lead. If he did it this way the first time, literally, we assume he'll do it literally the second time also. So that's why we, we just take it that way. Yeah, amen. And um, one of the things, too, that's uh, happening today is with someone making um, a website, you know, anybody can do that these days. This is a dangerous time. Listen, you can create a website, you can create a blog, you can be somebody from anywhere, and you can, you can say something and generate interest uh, in a crowd. But it doesn't mean that that person's speaking truth. You can take that to the point where you can use the Bible. For example, I'm not, and I'm not clumping people together who are out there blogging stuff about Jesus, the Bible, and all that stuff together in this context. That didn't Satan use the word to even attack Jesus in the wilderness wanderings? When he was there 40 days, 40 nights, the enemy came, Satan came, and used the word of God, he tried to, against Jesus. 
He, Don mentioned context. We want to be so careful that when we say things like, and look at today, when we say things like the earthquake yesterday, the horrible earthquake, again, second earthquake in a week in Mexico. Uh, today, another huge earthquake in Japan. The frequency of, of the earthquakes. Uh, listen, according to the Bible, according to Jesus, are they to increase? Yes. Are they to get larger? Yes. But when you take what's happening in the news right now and say, we're in the tribulation period, see? No. That's wrong. When you say, oh, look, this verse, and look, you could, you could watch global events, context. Now, you're, you can watch global events, reach into your Bible. For example, you can reach into Matthew 24 or Luke 21 and pull a verse out and say, oh, wow, look, this is what's happening. You've got to be careful because as excited as we could get about that, you've got to read all the verses that are around that verse, and you've got to even read the chapter, and then listen, as you pull back with your microscope, you want to read the chapters that are around that chapter to get the context of what is being said. Look, for those of us who love Jesus, we want Jesus to come back now. May he come tonight. Yeah, That's our right. prayer. That's our desire. But we've got a whole different audience out there right now, and we're going to know a lot. Uh, is it a Saturday evening or Sunday morning by some of the things that have been said? And p they're pastors and they're, and they're uh, Christian leaders, and they're saying this is going to happen, and we'll talk about some of the reasons why they say it's going to happen, but uh, this is what's going to happen, this is why we're, we're saying this. And, the, and then you ask them, or you see their publication, what are you basing this on? And those verses are all not only tribulation period verses, but they're the last half of the tribulation period of issues. So speak to us again or more about context. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I'm glad you brought that up because, see, you have to read anything in context to make it make sense. For example, I say the word trunk to you. What am I talking about? <laughs> trunk. What am I talking about, Jack? Did you say trunk or trump? Tr no, no, no. <laughs> The context is not only important, it's if you can hear what the context is. Yeah, I brought an amplified Bible if you have problems here. So, all right. No, trunk. Okay. Trunk. T R U N K. What, okay, do I, okay. what do I mean? What am I talking about? A trunk, a car. Am I? A, an elephant snout. What else? A tree. What else? That's right. Yeah, it's a lot of different things. Okay, so one word by itself, you need a context. Well, how about a sentence? I, how about this sentence? He sold a lot of stock. What am I talking about? Well, the stock market. He sold... Wall it. Street? Yeah, of course. Where else? Farm? Cattle? That's right. You know, hardware store? <laughs> Soup. Soup. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you see the problem. Even, in t even an entire sentence needs a context, yeah, right? Yeah. And one word is, you know, can mean a lot of different things. An entire sentence has to have a context to it. That's why we read the Bible from beginning to end. We don't do, you know, one verse here, one mm. verse there. And that's the problem. Like you said, Revelation 12, there's 11 chapters preceding it, and there's, you know, a number of chapters after that. You just can't pick something out and do it. It's not like some magic book. And that's the problem that people make. So let's always remember context. One word is not sufficient. Even a whole sentence is it. You have to read it. What comes before, what comes after. All right? Wow. Um, okay, so those of you who attend here, uh, there was, it was a week or two ago when I showed a particular website of a, of a lady that's near and dear to us. You, you know, I don't even want to say her name because I love her. Um, and I, I read, I read that, that post, and it's all true. America needs to repent, right? There's no doubt about it. America needs to get right with God. I, I absolutely agree. So do you. But then there was a verse, but given her, you know, given her slack and grace, the verse was from Joel. Remember that, if you looked at it? Uh, and that verse aligns, if you're going to do good Bible study and, mm -hmm. and, and good Bible interpretation, context, the book of Joel is talking about once Israel's back into their land, and they are, but they're in a time of Jacob's trouble. They're in the time of what Jeremiah and Isaiah speak about. It is the tribulation days, and Joel is talking about that, and, and Joel is speaking just before Christ comes to establish his kingdom on earth. That's the context. That verse was put on the site, 
And I could have completely let that go, but then there was that video YouTube clip of something that completely uh, is the cause for us even doing this night. Right. This thing about uh, you know, the eclipse and, uh, and all these things are going to happen and this is what's going to happen on the 23rd and all these things from some other teacher. Not from her, but from some other teacher. But listen, any decent Bible reader would have known that's, that's a good verse it's from the Bible, but that's a verse that's going to be fulfilled later. For example... Uh, there's a lot of, lot of talk right now, Don, you have written books on this, about the steam, the inertia, the momentum of all that's coming about with the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Correct. That's a big deal, ladies and gentlemen. That is a big deal. It's underway, and many of the implements are, are made. Don's written books on this. You can get those books. So when people say, well, you know what? That's happening right now. So if that's happening right now, then uh, we must be uh, at the opening doors of the tribulation period. You can't say that. You can't say that. These are things in context that I would say are stage setting things. These are things that, wow, if they're talking about a temple in Jerusalem and if they're creating a priestly order and, and uh, the uh, implements and the dyes and the ashes of the red heifer, if they're getting ready for that, how close are we to really seeing some tremendous things? It's not the fulfillment of the prophecy right then and there, but it is certainly the stage setting because the prophecy could, could be fulfilled any time where a temple is allowed to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. Do you see what I'm saying? We need to slow down rather than, uh, not you, others write books and say how the four blood moons are going to happen and all these things are going to take place and that's, that's the deal. And then, it ha and then all this happens. The blood moons come and go, and, and nothing that they prophesied using scriptures. Church, they use scriptures. These scriptures will be fulfilled. When I had a hard time with it just at the beginning, because the Bible doesn't say anywhere about four blood moons. None whatsoever. It talks about a blood moon, and it talks about, in the same day, the sun not shining its light. Context is absolutely essential. Anything else? No, that's good, because if you, unless you do that, read the Bible in context, that's where cults get going. That's where all this kooky nonsense gets going. But if you read it, it just from beginning to end, it makes total sense. It, it's one unfolding story. God, you know, from beginning to end, the story of redemption through God the Son, Jesus Christ. Again, it's all about him. But like Jack said, when you start taking things, a word here, a thought there, and you don't put it in the context that's there in Scripture, then you can come up with basically anything. And so our goal should always be, what is God trying to tell us? And we should probably get the memo that over and over again, when people continue to predict the time of the end, this is not the first time this has happened, by the way. There's over 100 different times in the history of the Christian church that someone set an exact date for the time the end is going to come. And guess what? None of them got it right yet. And, there, and, and this other guy with September 23rd isn't right either because, you know, I mean, Jesus said, nobody knows the day or the hour, neither, not even the angels in heaven, and in the context, neither the sun. So my question is, what part about nobody knows don't you understand? <laughs> I mean, really. That's true. Uh, and, and as we mentioned, I thank you guys, forgive me for those of you who are here, but didn't we even mention that last Sunday or the Sunday before? that it's something that in the Jewish context, and, Jew, and by the way, Jesus is communicating context. When you read Matthew chapter 23, 24, and 25, uh, it is Jesus speaking to the Jewish people and, and the nation Israel. You have to remember that. I, was, uh, I got an email from somebody accusing me, Pastor Jack, I'm so sorry that you've really taken, uh, the, they use the word tank, they really, you really tanked. You used to love the fact that Jesus could, could come back at any time. That's not changed. But the person went on to accuse me that uh, you should see all these things regarding September 23rd and be excited. And you should get ready because the rapture is happening this week. And, and yet, when Jesus spoke to the disciples and to Israel in the context he said, for example, in Matthew 24, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by its enemies... And when you, he goes down to read, when you see uh, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the place where it ought not, come down from your housetop and flee. Listen, all of that is yet future. 
All of that is still to come. Now, there were certain things throughout Israel's history where Israel or Jerusalem was surrounded. And they had various events where the sanctuary was uh, destroyed or um, what's the word? defiled Antiochus yep. Epiphanes, for right. one. All of that kind of stuff. But this is futuristic because the context demands that at the same time that happens, there's going to be... In a very short order, order of time, there's going to be global lawlessness. Yes. Now, let's be honest. Is there not global lawlessness today like we've yep. never seen? Exactly. Yes, absolutely. So when I see that, I don't deny that Jesus is coming back. I'm saying, man, it's close for this reason. If we're starting to see things set up that the tribulation period describes, right? And I am premillennial in my Bible interpretation, which means I'm a literalist, which means I'm a futurist. That's right. Which means I'm pre-tribulational. Correct. Which means I believe the Bible teaches that clearly, which means I believe that there's a great difference between the church and Israel. They're not the same. The church never replaced Israel. I understand when I read the Bible that if I'm starting to see things line up, global mayhem, the craziness, the global economies, uh, even this thing about national borders, you guys think that it's a, a U.S.-Mexico issue? Oh, no. Europe, Europe is off the grid crazy. Europe almost has no more borders. Okay, all of this stuff tells me if I'm starting to see the stage being set for tribulation issues, then I'm wondering why we're still standing around here. I mean, I'm expecting to go up any day, and I, you know, I thought it was going to be yesterday, but, <laughs> but then I thought it was going to be today. So this is, this is a tremendous time, but um, what else would you want to add to okay, this segment? You gave, a, uh, years and years ago, I hope you remember this, you gave this great analogy about how we know we're near the time of the end with the, the ship coming into the port. Yeah. Why don't you tell that one again? I love the way you, you did that. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I wish I could take credit for this. John Walbert, right? Exactly. Yeah, I good. remember that. It's only about 25 years ago. I wish, yeah. yeah, I said that about 25 years ago, yeah. and he remembers it. Yeah. I can't remember what I said 20 minutes ago. <laughs> but, um, in fact, Dr. John Wolvert stood right here on this uh, platform, and he said that regarding biblical signs and what is revealed in Scripture, he said, if Jesus tells you all of these things are going to happen just before I come back to set up my kingdom, so you be looking for these things, and he writes them down in the Gospels, and he puts them in a bus, a big yellow school bus, and you know on the front of the bus it says school bus? He says, let's ride on their tribulation period. And he says, let's put Satan behind the wheel. He's driving the bus. <laughs> so he said, that's down the road now. That's, that's, that's set up. And Jesus now says to you, the church, before that bus gets to this corner right here in the street, I want you to stand here. I want you to wait for me. Before that bus ever shows up, I'm going to pick you up in my red sports car. Jesus will come up and pull, you, pull up in his red sports car and pick you up. So you be, you be ready. You don't know when I'm going to come, but it's going to be really quick. And I'm going to pick you up. And Wolverine said that analogy right here to, to all of you who were here at that time. And he said, now here's what's really happening. We don't see any red sports car. We don't see Jesus behind the wheel. But we look down the road and we see a yellow dot and the yellow dot now has gotten closer. The yellow dot now we identify is a bus, and it says tribulation period. He said we can even make out the license plate. It's 666, California, <laughs> 666. <laughs> and he said you, you, you we're able to make out that inside. Look, look ahead. I, we're starting to see. Do you see where, I'm, where he went with this? And he said, what does it mean with the yellow bus getting so close? He said, stop looking at the yellow bus. Get ready to meet Jesus in the red car. Yeah. And that's a great, great that's analogy, great analogy. Yeah. Uh, to keep in mind. So, uh, unless we have something else to talk about, we can actually dive into this next thing. Sure. You want to do that? Oh, yeah. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah, we're fine. You guys all right? Okay, you guys, I want to reset this then. Reset the gong. Oh, the, bu it's the true. buzzer. The it's buzzer. The buzzer. Okay, so here's the second thing, and that's good, because it's, it's gonna take some more time. Yeah, this is well. You guys, the second thing is this that we wanna look at tonight, and it's probably, possibly, what brought you out here the most, 
and that is what's going on. What's happening now? That's the very theme of our, of our gathering. What's happening right now? And I've got some things uh, that I want to lay out here, and then I want Don to jump in again. All of this is not rehearsed, but we're probably at the end going to say we should have rehearsed this. But um, I just want to say this regarding the second segment. Uh, there's this great danger of trying to create biblical relevance out of everything that seems to be happening in our world today by prophecy buffs. I'm going I'm to say prophecy buffs. What I mean by prophecy buffs are those who traffic solely in uh, what's happening now with, without getting into Bible doctrine, Bible teaching, the welfare and care of the church. In other words, I love, this church loves Bible prophecy, but you don't want to hobby horse it. You don't want it to be uh, the one, only... One string banjo. One string banjo. That gets boring really quick. And listen, if you don't have something to report on and people know you as a prophecy buff... The pressure, like CNN, is to create fake news, mm -hmm. is to pay people. No, really, you know, these guys have come out. This guy was paid to create this Russian fake news thing, and they're in trouble now. But there are people that are in trouble because they're, they're, the string on their guitar is only Bible prophecy. <laughs> and if something doesn't happen, they're going to make stuff up. That's a danger. People, you don't want to do that. You want to be very careful about that. So this thing about what's happening now... With that said, we want to be a reasonable, level-headed people to look at some of the things that are going on around us. And so let's just dive into this right now. Uh, signs and wonders. We're being told right now, these are the signs and wonders that the prophets talked about. What's, what are the signs and wonders? Well, it's not only this, the earthquake and, and the tsunami of some years back and this other thing. Uh, the, the big thing is what we're talking, we're going to talk about soon is, is Revelation chapter 12 and the signs and the wonders. And this is the greatest sign of all. And so look at the screens right now. I want to bring you up to date if you haven't seen this. Uh, this is the Daily yeah. Mail out of London. And it's saying, uh, is the world going to end on September 23rd? This is where it really bothers me. It, this should bother you. Biblical prophecy of the rapture predicts yeah. The apocalypse will occur on that exact date. Ladies and gentlemen, this is exactly what prophecy buffs who have that one string guitar will take that headline and they're going to show it to their congregations and say, you see, it's going to happen. And I'm here to tell you right now that this is the Daily Mail from London. There is no biblical prophecy announcing that the rapture is predicted with this apocalyptic exact date of... September 23rd. In fact, Don, is not the rapture of the church called the Blessed Hope? Exactly. It's not the apocalyptic nope. disaster. Nope. nope. And so this is exactly why we're up here tonight. This is exactly what we're talking about. You want to say something? Yeah. Um, there's stories like that we see. There's a lot of I read one from a Philadelphia newspaper today, and it said, if, if you got nothing to do this week, and you better you know, get it done quick, because the world's going to end on Saturday. <laughs> and they went through, you know, they, they made a real sarcastic thing about it. Right. Then they quoted this Canadian journalist who was going to talk with one of these guys who has the website, like the main guy about it, but he's not taking interviews that next week. He said, this week, he said, talk to me next week. Oh. <laughs> now, yeah. Uh, the world's going to end on Saturday, but he's not, he's not available until next week. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, boy. It's... <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what, I mean, what, what can you say to that? But here's the problem. Again, it, these kind of things, Jack, cause the heathen to blaspheme because the Bible doesn't teach any of this nonsense. Right. None of this. There's no specific day. We saw that in uh, May 21st, 2011, yeah. uh, with Harold was Camping. The, uh, oh, yeah, Harold okay. Camping. And they got the Mayan calendar, too. That was, it was 2010, thing. then the Mayan calendar, 2012. And people were sure this is going to be the end. This is the end. And it wasn't the end. Uh, because nobody knows the day and the hour. And the rapture of the church is an event that, you know, again, comes when no one's expecting it, at the time you least expect that the yeah, Lord no will one. come back. And yet uh, people think they could know when Jesus said angels don't even know, nobody knows. And yet you got a newspaper not knowing what the Bible says, taking that and using that as a chance to ridicule Christians, which is just horrible. But again, the first thing we want to get across, the Bible does not predict this. It doesn't set 
dates. And it never has with respect to the coming of the Lord for mm -hmm. his church. And, it, you know, and we just don't need to understand that. You guys, one of the articles, um, and it may be on one of the clips that we have here tonight or not, I can't remember, but I wrote down the quote. It said one of, uh, that the September 23rd event is one of the most monumental signs in the history of Christianity. That's a huge statement, ladies and gentlemen. So here's what happens to the non-believer. And if you're a non-believer watching right now, and I hope you are, most non-believers, they're waiting for this day to pass, and then they're going to say, you Christians are crazy. And you're going to have to agree with them. Yeah. You're going to have to say, I'm sorry. You need to tell them, listen, that's not what, the, what, what was said by people is not what the Bible had to say. Okay, and this thing is not the most monumental event or history in the history of the church. And when we talk about the end, we need to remember in the context of this church, and I hope for those of you who are watching right now, when we talk about the end, do you understand for the believer, the end is the beginning? Right. Do you understand that? When we say the end, it's the end of the church on earth. The end that we talk about is the end of the church's time on earth. The Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit's going to be the one that delivers the custody of the church into the hands of Jesus at the rapture. That's the end for us. The end is just the beginning. Now, you say, well, what if you're not a believer? The end is just beginning for you as well this way. <laughs> the end cannot come. You know, listen, the end, what are you talking about the end? Well, the end... It's got to be at least seven more years from now, as of tomorrow morning. It's got to be at least seven years. How long is the tribulation period? Seven years. But we know this. That's not the end. Because doesn't Jesus Christ come back with the church, Revelation 19, at the end of the seven years? And then how long does he reign, church? A thousand years. The end is not for 1,007 years as of right now. I'm not date setting, but I'm just saying the end is a long time. The context matters. Are you alive right now? Do you know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins on the cross, just as the ancient prophets foretold, rose again from the dead, exactly as prophecy foretold, and that you go to heaven based on your faith in him and his work alone at the cross for your salvation, adding nothing. That truth causes you to be transformed, not by your own strength. God's spirit will transform your life if you'll take God at his word. So what we want to avoid is what we're hearing right now. And by the way, it has been the hottest trending search on Google uh, in, these, in these last nine months. Uh, and that is the words, the great sign. And they're referring to Revelation chapter 12. So before we go any further, I want to show you this this clip as well. Look to the screen. For years, theologians have studied the celestial event known as the Star of Bethlehem and how exactly the people of that day knew it would signify the birth of Christ. But now, there is a new sign that theologians have discovered in the heavens, one that has never occurred before and according to astronomers, will never occur again. A complex convergence of aligning constellations and planets that researchers have calculated will unfold over the course of nine months. A unique occurrence that shockingly mirrors an ancient biblical warning called the Great Sign that is foretold to precede a series of disastrous global events that have researchers now scrambling for answers. And when is this supposed to happen? This year, in 2017. It's big with the oil and gas. Is this unprecedented event just a coincidence? Or could this truly be the great sign that biblical prophecy has foretold would occur right before the end of days? Notice the clock right there on the, see the yeah. clock? That's real time. See the clock ticking down? Yeah. They're counting down. This is right now, you can go, don't do it now, but you can go to their, you can go to their website and it's counting down. This is a big deal. Okay, that's how convinced they are that they got a countdown timer of what's going to happen. First of all, number one, that's great graphics. Yeah, that's really good. It's great graphics. And did you hear the voice coming this fall? Jesus Christ will appear 2017. He states it like a movie trailer exactly. as a fact. Then he goes on to say, is this the meaning of it? Is this what's going to happen? Okay, say, which one is it? This is such a serious issue, and people really care about this issue. 
We all care no matter who we are. Is it true or is it false? Is it happening or is it not? But when you pitch it this way, this is marketing genius right here. And all it does is cause confusion. Are crazy things coming? Yes. Could Jesus come back tonight? Please. Is the world coming undone? Are all of these things going around the world like never before seen? Earthquakes and volcanic stuff and race uh, against race and all that? Yes, but according to the Bible, it's got to increase even more for the second coming to happen, not the rapture. There's a big difference, okay? Please. So we're not... I want to commend their zeal for Bible prophecy, but I cannot commend their accuracy. <laughs> you, you know, Jack, it should have started out once upon a time, then it would have been better context. Yeah. And, you know, then and they live happily. But it ever sounds ever. good. Well, it sounds so great. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's, it, yeah, it sounds great. They did a great job, but it's total nonsense. I want to read this uh, one, from one of the articles regarding Revelation chapter 12. In fact, how about I do this, you guys? Let's, let me read Revelation 12, or you can grab, in fact, you ought to just turn there in your Bibles. If you're at home, got your Bible open, grab it, get a highlighter. If you click on various websites that are trending in this thing, they're saying everybody knows the meaning of the interpretation of Revelation 12. That's how they start out their comment. Everybody knows the interpretation of Revelation 12. And then they embark upon an interpretation that nobody knows about. (laughs) And if it wasn't for NASA, we never would have known about it. I don't think God needs NASA to help the Christian figure out what's coming up. So listen carefully, everybody. Revelation 12. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet. Remember, this is a sign. And on her head, a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she carried, uh, cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign, by the way, the Greek word is another sign, just like the first sign of verse 1, which means another great sign. It's just as great as the first great sign in verse 1. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. You'll never know what that means unless you've read your Old Testament. And seven diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child. Notice in your Bible, if you have a real Bible, C in child is capitalized. As soon as it was born, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that she should feed uh, her there, he should feed her there 1,260 days. Stop right there. 1,260 days. According to a biblical year, there's 360 days in a biblical year. From Genesis to Revelation, there's 360 days in a Bible year. Not your Gregorian calendar that you and I have today. You got that? Half of seven years, half of a seven-year biblical period is 1,260 days. That's the first half. That's three and a half years. The second half is 1,260 days. Are you with me, everybody? This verse, Revelation chapter 12, is speaking about the last half of the tribulation period where the woman is taken or made away into the wilderness where she's kept and protected. The announcement at the front end of the verses is regarding the coming of the Messiah. You can read commentators forever and they will tell you, well, they'll tell you what the rest of the Bible says about Revelation chapter 12. You would, ha- you would never know about Revelation chapter 12 unless you read Genesis chapter 37. You have to read Genesis 37 to ever, to ever be able to understand Revelation 12. In fact, can I say this, everybody? If you don't go here, uh, you need to hear this. And if you go here, you've heard it enough, but you need to be reminded. You, you must read the Old Testament before you can ever understand the book of Revelation. It demands it. You want to know why? Outside of chapter 4, verse 1 and beyond, it's heavily Jewish for a reason. So let me read this. It's, um, 
It's, one of, it's from an article or a commentary. The imagery is taken directly from Joseph's dream in Genesis 37. The woman is Israel, who birthed the male child, the Messiah. The dragon, Satan, tried to devour Jesus using Herod's slaughter of the babies of Bethlehem. But the male child ascended to God's throne where he waits to return to earth and rule the nations with a rod of iron during his millennial kingdom. That commentary is 100% biblically sound based on other Bible verses. Everybody should get this. Now let me read a comment by these modern day whatever. It is September 23rd. It is the very day when the constellation Virgo, a virgin woman clothed with the sun, will have at her feet the moon. The nine stars of the constellation, Leo, plus the three planets, Mercury, Venus, and Mars, will align atop her head. On her head, a garland of 12 stars. The king planet, Jupiter, the male child, will end its nine months circling within Virgo. So she's pregnant, I guess, with Jupiter around this orbit that the scientists are watching. And by the way, all this is true astronomically. The alignment, the movements of of these heavenly bodies, this is true. But watch. So circling within Virgo and finally exit East, past her feet, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth and be carried away, or what do they say? Raptured. They make the child the church, yet the Bible tells us that Israel never produced the church, did she? Israel produced the Messiah. In fact, it goes back to the Genesis chapter 3 verse, technically. It does. Mary is being referred to in Genesis, but more technically, it's Israel. The Messiah would come from Israel. Now, pray tell, are there any other books of the Bible that announce that the Messiah would come from Israel? It's called the Bible. (laughs) But they take this, listen, they interpret the science of the astronomers, which is cool stuff, and they make it Bible prophecy fulfillment. And this has caused millions of people to be wondering now, what in the world is going to happen on that day? Don, anything? Yeah, but we only have 45 minutes to talk about it. Okay, uh, <laughs> where to begin? Number one, Revelation, there, there's no chapters and verses in the original in the Bible. Revelation chapter 12 is a continuation of Revelation chapter 11. In Revelation chapter 11, it talks about two witnesses who have a three and a half year ministry who call down fire from heaven, do signs and wonders. They are put to death by this final antichrist who comes. Their bodies lie in state for three and a half days in the city of Jerusalem. And at that particular time, God brings them back to life in front of the whole world, which is watching, by the way. And they go, they ascend into heaven. A great earthquake happens at Jerusalem in that time, and the Ark of the Covenant is seen in heaven uh, yep. when this all occurs. Let me tell you something, people. That ain't happened yet. We wouldn't have missed something like that, right? I mean, an event like those things have not happened. And Revelation 12 comes right after Revelation 11. That's the first problem. Number two, uh, every sign in Scripture that's given comes unexpectedly. This thing's expected. This thing has been predicted. This is not a sign. And number three, if I'm not mistaken, can anybody see it with their naked eye? Wow. Well, well, what sort of sign is that if nobody can see it? No one can see it, but we know it's there because you have to have a a telescope, but it's, it's predictable. This is not the signs of the Bible. The signs of the Bible come when no one's expecting it. So that's just at the beginning, Jack. Can I I totally interrupt you right now? Go ahead. If NASA tells me, for example, and all the astronomers in the world tell me, based on their computer model, that on August, was it August 21st? The eclipse happened? Yeah. That the eclipse is going to happen, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to sweep across America. I say, that's cool. That's pretty amazing. And I, I went and got my glasses, although it kind of stunk here. We didn't see much of it, right? Southern California, we... It was a clear day, but it was kind of weak, right? Uh, We weren't close enough. But um, 
that was hailed as a sign. Did you know that, everybody? That was hailed as a sign. In fact, the big deal right now is yeah. August 21st, yeah. nothing happens. But what we meant to say was <laughs> September 23rd is 33 days after the eclipse. Did you read this? Of course. It's 33 days after the eclipse, and that's how old Jesus was when he was crucified. <laughs> It's true. That's how old he was when he was crucified. Right. What does that have to do with the eclipse? And what does hysteria have to do with what NASA is saying? NASA gives an, an actual scientific event and predicts it. I love what Don said a moment ago. It's signs and wonders. It's not signs and wonders. First of all, if it's a sign and a wonder, you will not have to wonder if it's a sign or a wonder. Exactly. You're going to know it. Yeah. And it's not going to be what people can predict. No. Exactly what he said a moment yeah. ago. What's going to happen? If you want to see the sun darkened, there will be no natural explanation. That's a sign and a wonder. If the moon looks as though it turns into blood and there's no volcanic ash in the atmosphere and there's nothing yeah. goofing up the atmosphere and it happens, that's going to get your attention. That is a sign and a wonder. There are things that cannot be explained. So when you tell me to look up on, on September 23rd, because this is what's going to happen with the planets... And this is the fulfillment of scripture. I don't buy it. I just don't buy it. If something happens suddenly and it's biblical, now you got me. Now you got my attention. So let's play the, the Fox News clip. Again, this is all very embarrassing. Okay, we didn't put the music, that was Fox music. Yeah, we didn't put the music, although it is, the music's great, but it's out of context. Um, yeah. That's on, that's on the news. Yeah. And I'm watching this and it's like, you know what? I don't blame people for pushing the Bible away from them saying, this is loony, this is crazy. And that breaks my heart. And you saw the verses cited, Luke 21, for example, exactly, exactly what we talked about earlier. Those things are going to happen. Yeah. And we may be seeing stage set events taking place, but that's not the fulfillment. We're not seeing the fulfillment. We're not in the... Luke 21 is in the tribulation period. So according to the theology of some of these guys, the midpoint of the tribulation... Have you ever heard of pre-wrath or mid-tribulation people? They're believing that September 23rd is the middle. That's what, that's, it's going to happen. This is the midpoint. You can't get to Re uh, Revelation 12 unless you have the first 11 chapters. We need to think this through. We need to apply Bible, ladies and gentlemen. And so, I think you already said this, but uh, where, where's the Jewish temple? Yeah. If exactly. this is going to happen, then where's the temple in Israel? I want to ask this question. Who's the Antichrist? Some, pe some people say Trump. He made a, he's working on a peace deal. Okay, right now. Some people say Barack Obama because he won't go away. He's trying to make a comeback. <laughs> okay, it's... The Bible's very clear about who the Antichrist exactly. is. He's going to be brilliant. He's going <laughs> to be persuasive. He'll rise out of the old European <laughs> Empire. Uh, when did the rapture take place? Where's the 144,000? Born again, Hebrew, Jewish, male, virgins. Uh, where are they? I want to know where they're at. Um... Okay, let's, let's change a little bit. We, have, we, sure. we need to... Oh, um, very, we need to do this quick. Some of the things that are happening now on top of this, sure. this hysteria. North Korea, Persia. You guys know who Persia is, right? Iran. So North Korea, Persia, Turkey, the Russian Triangle, Israel's enemies, the soon uh, coming 
uh, demise of Syria, or Damascus more specifically. The Bible says that Damascus is, uh, is going to be destroyed suddenly without warnings. We kind of anticipate that uh, that could happen at any time as well. The Ezekiel battle, yep. if you like it or not, friends, I mean, I honestly thought the Ezekiel battle would have more drama to it, that Russia would be coming in from Moscow with planes and it would be this big, like a swarm of clouds. And it's very possible that I missed that one completely because why? Russia's already in the Middle East. <laughs> They're setting up camp, they got airports, they've got their military. They're doing right now as we speak, the largest Russian live fire military, uh, 100,000 troops. Uh, Europe is very upset right now at this hour. I was watching the news several hours ago. Belarus doesn't think Russia's gonna leave along the European border. That's a big issue. That's a terrifying thing going on. So uh, Don, talk talk about that. Are we looking possibly at stage setting? Regarding Ezekiel um, and what's happening with the Middle East too? Yeah, yeah, okay. Ezekiel 38, 39 talks about an invasion of Israel in the last days in the north, south, east, and west. Seven or eight nations, depending on how you, you divide them up, will attack Israel. The Bible talks about 10 specific things that are going to be in place before that invasion occurs. All you have to do is read Ezekiel 38, 39. You'll find certain things. Israel will still exist. They'll be in their land in the last days. There'll be a land that's been destroyed by war, which they've turned around and created great wealth, which will cause these nations to attack, et cetera, et cetera. Each of these 10 have been literally fulfilled to set the, 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 that sets the stage. Now, there's other things that are going to happen once the, the invasion takes place. But 10 things have to be in place to set the stage for this invasion, and they're all in place right now as we speak. So Jack, like you're right, the stage is set. Um, For years and years, one of the questions we had, how could Israel be taken by surprise with an invasion from Russia, Iran, Turkey? Well, real simple, they're not coming from Russia, Iran, and Turkey. They're coming from the northern border of Israel. They're coming from Syria. They'll be coming from Lebanon. They're right there right now. They've got a Russian setup two kilometers from the uh, Israeli border border there in the Golan Heights. They've got Iranian officers and Russian officers working together in, quote, administration buildings there. They're building weapons factories in Lebanon and in Syria. So all this is setting the stage right now. You know, military base, so they don't have to come a long way. They're right there on the doorstep of Israel. And so that is stage setting, and that is huge. And one of the things we we talk about, as we're beginning to see these things fulfilled, we're seeing the stage set for the fulfillment, the 10 things in Ezekiel 38, 39. When a third temple will be built, eight things have to be in place. Eight thi- well, eight things are going to happen for the temple to be built. Five of them are already in, in place. Only three more things need to happen. So, ba- And the preparations are being made for those three things. So the bottom line is, Jack, right in front of us, we see all these things taking place right in front of our eyes. What's awesome, too, is the Bible in Ezekiel talks about Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, the tribal ancient names of the land or peoples that were north of the Caucasus Mountains, the ancient regions, uh, Scythians, if I remember Scythians, right. Scythians, correct. You guys, what's amazing is many of you, if not all of you, you were alive to watch Rosh be brought into existence because it, something had to happen for that to take place. What was it? Remember, remember Ronald Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall? Mm-hmm. And do you remember when Reagan said, we're going to build the Star Wars defense program? I don't know if you guys, some of you guys are in military, but it's an amazing thing. In, in war school, in the United States military, in, in tactic and in, in, uh, warfare regarding policy and um, propaganda, did you know that Reagan's words are studied in warfare? Because at the time, Ronald Reagan when he asked his advisors, can we build a bubble over America with satellites and missiles and shoot down any invader? And they said, absolutely not. The technology doesn't even exist for that to happen. That doesn't... We're out of time? Yes. We got the gong already? Okay. I guess I'll have we to did. stop with that one. But um... oh. Finish the story. Okay. Um, that didn't take much, did it? I mean, so, I'll sit out. So all of Reagan's advisors came back and said, it's impossible. The technology to do that hasn't even been invented. And he said, yeah, but the Russians don't know that. And he said, let's do it. Did you know he commissioned a massive budget to invent something that couldn't be created? 
Did you know that during those years following, the United States leaked information to the Russians that we had it? It freaked them out that they started doing the same thing. And Reagan destroyed the Soviet Union financially. They went broke trying to catch up to what we didn't even have. <laughs> Turns out, I've been asking some questions of some friends lately. The fun part is they've been very careful in how they respond because they work in the government and they said, I can't answer you exactly because the government that I work for is watching these text messages. So, like, make, make, make this story a little bit more interesting is that we had a chance to talk face to face. And what's happening, I've been asking all of you in this church for the last two and a half years, I said, keep your eyes as things heat up in the Middle East, keep your eyes in the North Pacific because something's going to happen with China or North Korea. While America sends its interest and its attention to the North, I expect Iran to do something stupid. We've been seeing this for the last several years. It doesn't make me a prophet. I just know my Bible. And I still say that tonight. Something is going to happen with North Korea. I don't know what. But make no mistake about it, Iran and North Korea are in perfect cahoots with each other on this. Under the, under the watchful eye of Russia. I hope I'm wrong. I hope the rapture happens tonight. But listen, something's going to happen to the United States. Somehow America's got to be depleted, distracted, somehow, somehow belly up in some way to not come and help Israel during its time of being invaded, because the Bible tells us in Ezekiel the nations will only question that movement. They will not do anything about it. Before we go into q and I want to I leave you guys with this. This is awesome. Uh, this week, was it yesterday or the day before Donald Trump and Benjamin Netanyahu spoke at the UN? Yesterday. Yesterday? Uh, Netanyahu reminds the United Nations that Israel has a divine ally against all of her enemies. Listen to what he said. He then said this, Netanyahu told the United Nations, indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. That's what Netanyahu told the UN Whoa. yesterday. And he reminded them that Israel has a divine protector in the Lord above. Questions now, questions. Let me start the timer. Don, quick, go to Matthew 24, 36, but yeah. I think it's talking about uh, when one's taken, the other one left. Is it the same as Luke 21? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What, and, Make and, sure, because I don't want to no, be out of context. It is. It is. It's, uh, See how unrehearsed this is? Nobody knows, only the Father in heaven, as the days of Noah oh. were, and then one taken, one left. Yeah. Uh, it's possible. There's good people that differ on that I one. I know. Because you've got a, a little switch there in the context. You can, you can argue either way, uh, whether it's the rapture of the church or the second coming of Christ, because both... You know, there's some amb amb ambiguity in the language there. So, yeah, it could very well be uh, the rapture of the church. Some people see that in that. There's a guy named John Hart from Moody Bible Institute wrote a three-part series a number of years ago uh, for you know, Tim, Tim Wahey's, uh, yep. Tommy Ice's website, arguing that that was the rapture of the church. I think it was a good job. Um, but, you know, it could be. It's one of those ones good people differ on. And it talks about, you know, two grinding at the mill, one taken, one left, two in the bed, one taken, one left. Is that the rapture or the second coming? Well, it's going to be true in both places. The one, uh, although in the rapture, they're taken to be with the Lord. In the second coming, they're taken to judgment. So, it, you know, again, context. He's being very good. That was great what he just said because um, it's true. There's great people in both camps. Yeah. When you read uh, Matthew, 20, Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13 together, now, are you guys listening? This is one reporter's opinion. This reporter happens to think he's right <laughs> about his opinion, but I, here's, here's the thing. When, when Jesus said, one will be at the mill, or two will be at the mill grinding, one taken, the other one left, you met, you've read that. Yeah. One taken, the other one left. It is possible, exactly what Don just said, that the Lord is making a general overall statement regarding the comings. Remember, there's the, there's the appearing of Christ in the atmosphere, John 14, 
where I've, I've gone to prepare a place for you. I'm going to come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you will be also, the rapture, John 14, 1, 2, and 3. It could be that. But I believe it's Luke 21. It doesn't matter. It's, it's Luke 21 or Mark 13. It says, the disciples ask a very key question. They ask, where, Lord? That's all they say. He says they're taken away. And he says, where, Lord? And he says an interesting thing. He says, wherever the, in the English, it says wherever the eagle or eagles are gathered together uh, or wherever the body is, there the eagle will be. And some have said, Jesus is the eagle, the body is Christ. Right? You've heard that? Mm -hmm. It's possible. But the last time I checked, and you're the scholar, I may be wrong, but the last time I checked, the body does not refer to a living body, and the word is not eagle. It's actually vulture or flesh-eating bird. Now, Don, I need you to correct me or elaborate because this guy, this guy knows it. Yeah. My, my argument is this. If the disciples asked where are they taken, I would go with they're taken to judgment because the bodies are there, and it, I don't think the Lord's going to refer to himself, if in fact I've got it right, that it's a flesh-eating bird. I don't know if the Lord's going to refer to himself as a flesh-eating bird because I think a flesh-eating bird would be an unclean animal. I just, that's my thing. I may be pushing it too far. A little bit. But, okay. <laughs> but I, I, let me go back. Concerning yeah. the day and the hour, no one knows. There's two, let me go on something on that. There's a known day and an unknown day. That's right. The unknown day is the rapture of the church, but the known day of the second coming, right? Thank you. Daniel chapter 12, you guys. Did you guys hear what he just said? It's, it's greatly missed in Bible prophecy. 12-11. The day that Jesus came into Jerusalem, his first official arrival to Jerusalem, did you know that that day was prophesied in the book of Daniel to the very day? And Jesus in Matthew 23, 24 held them accountable to know the day, and they didn't. And I believe, I think is what Don is saying too, the other day that is known, Daniel chapter 12 answers that, where the, the Jews will know, based upon the day that the Antichrist declares himself to be God, Daniel 12 gives you the countdown of when the Messiah comes back for Israel, just like he came for the first time. The rapture has no preconditions, has no warnings, has no uh, need of anything being fulfilled. So I'm so glad you brought that up. That's great. Yeah, and so uh, it's an unknown day. The rapture can happen any time, but once certain events start taking place, this is important to understand. Daniel 9, 27, once this agreement is signed or covenant confirmed, you can start counting time. It's seven years because in the exact middle of that is when the abomination of desolation takes place and the, you know, where the temple is defiled. The final Antichrist comes and puts his image in the temple and declares himself to be God. And so then it says in Daniel 12, 11, when this happens, 1,260 right. days, 90 days, 1,290 days later, the Lord's here. And so we know when the, when the coming of the Lord will be, but the rapture is an unknown day at any time, any place. And so that's why there's two days. And you can't have, this, you can't have a day unknown and known at the same time. They've got to be two different days. That's why the rapture awesome. is different than the second coming. That's awesome. That's good. Next question. With tonight being the Jewish, oh, thank you. Tonight is Rosh Hashanah. Shana Tova. Tonight is the Jewish New Year. Yeah. Uh, many think that the rapture will happen during the annual feast. That would be awesome. Could you explain the significance of the last trumpet? Really quick, um, there, there is, can I, can I fix, can I play with your question just a little bit? I would never call, uh, I would never say the last trumpet. Uh, there's, there's, the, there's two trump, there's a trumpet, there's the first and there's the second trumpet. God told Moses in the book of Leviticus to make two silver trumpets. And listen, one of them is blown to gather Israel together for either convocation, fellowship, meal, celebration, worship, or war. Did you know that to this day, go ask a rabbi. They don't know what the other trumpet is for. There's the first trumpet, there's the second trumpet. Or the, but when you say the last trumpet, you're talking about, or I hope you're not talking about, don't confuse the trumpet judgments in the book of Revelation with the trumpet blast of the Lord Jesus for the church. Those are very separate Events, But yes, tonight is the Jewish uh, New Year. Yes, the Feast of Trumpets begins. I hope the rapture happens now. <laughs> that would be so cool during the trumpets. Um, but I can't tell you it's happening tonight or tomorrow. I wish I could. 
But anyway? I know, it, it could happen, again, at any particular time. And this is, again, the Jewish New Year. But we don't know the day or the hour. And Jesus said it comes at a time we think not, when we're not expecting it. So that's why I always said, like when uh, Harold Camping's day came about, I said, the rapture can come any day except May 21st, what was it, 2010. It's not going to come that day, because that's the day he thinks it's going to come. <laughs> so when we, think, when we think not, it's going to take place, and it's not going to come September 23rd. It comes September 22nd. I like that idea, but we, don't, we just don't know. And so, yeah, um, so that was, that was a good yeah. question. That that's excellent. good. Very yeah, good question. Very good question. I go, you go first, because okay, I'm yeah. really... Yeah, if, if you've heard the gospel but haven't accepted Christ and are left behind, well, you have an opportunity to accept Christ in the tribulation. Yeah, of course you will, because this is not like your last chance. There's going to be a, a multitude of people who come to faith in Jesus during the Great Tribulation, a countless number of people, the souls on the altar, the martyrs. Well, let me tell you something. They're going to come the hard way, the real <laughs> difficult way by giving their life and that. And the problem, like Pastor Chuck Smith used to say, uh, people would say, well, if this happens like you Christians say, the rapture comes, then I'll believe in Jesus. And he said, wait a minute, you're telling me you, you, you can't live for Christ now, but you can die for him sometime mm. in the future? Are you kidding me? Yeah. And so, yeah, uh, that's, there's not a cutoff there because people will still believe. Uh, and, and a lot of people believe because of the rapture of the church happens. There's going to be a great revival that takes place. So no, but here's the thing. Don't wait for that to happen before you believe because you don't know you're going to be alive at that time. And here's the, the key. We think, well, that might happen tomorrow or two days from now. Who of us has guaranteed we're going to be alive two days from now? James says our life is like a vapor. It just comes and goes like the fog in the morning. You know, it's like the guy in the parable Jesus uh, gave. Remember, he's, I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger barns. Mm -hmm. I've got many years ahead. And he died that night. A lot of people are going to, you know, well, I'll repent at the 11th hour. Trouble is they die at 1030. They never get to the 11th hour. <laughs> I have a slightly different view, and I want to read to you as why, because what I'm going to read, I hope that it causes enough concern for your soul tonight, if you're not a Christian, to, to remove any doubt. Because I agree 100% with Don. In fact, Don and I agree 100% with John. Yeah. John in the book of Revelation says that number that gets saved during the trib cannot even be counted. They come out of great tribulation. Okay? So that's awesome. But listen carefully to this. It's 2 Thessalonians 2. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come. Unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, he's talking about the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Well, there's no temple yet, but it won't take long. Those Jews can build things overnight. But listen... Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's the second coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Listen, everybody. And with all unrighteous deception among those who are perishing. Why are they perishing? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Is that terrifying? Yeah, very much so. Listen, this is how I understand this. If today you know this, that Jesus Christ, the Bible says, is God in the flesh, come to earth to die in your place on the cross, to suffer for your sins penalty, rose again from the dead so that you would not be condemned but have the opportunity to have eternal life. If you know that and you can tell me that and yet you reject that, I cannot think of any other verse in the Bible that describes better a person who could preach the gospel 
but don't, they don't believe in it. That should the rapture, again, I'm treading into my speculation right now, listen, that if you know the gospel so much so that, yeah, yeah, I know all about it, and you do, to willfully reject that and the rapture takes place and you miss it, I think that you will, be, that you will believe the lie that is sent by the Lord in judgment against those who had the opportunity to receive the love of the truth but did not. Now you might say, well, then that condemns everybody. Oh no, listen, the greatest evangelist, in my opinion, in the world will not be missionaries and the church. If such a number is saved out of the tribulation period that's so great no man, no man can number, the 144,000 are preaching the word let, all over. There's no doubt right. about it. But do you remember right before the end comes, do you remember what happens? Doesn't an angel or two angels Revelation fly? Revelation 14.6. Does... Mm -hmm. Revelation 14, 6, an angel flies through the atmosphere preaching the everlasting gospel. Mm -hmm. And then the end comes. There's going to be a massive host of people who come out of the mm -hmm. tribulation period. But if you know the gospel today, psst, I just told you the gospel a second ago. Boy, are you in trouble. <laughs> right? If you're sitting here saying, I'm not going to accept. Look, this is enough that ought to cause you to make a decision for Jesus now because why gamble with your eternal security soul on this one? No way, don't do it. Next question. What happens after the thousand year reign of Christ on earth? I could answer, but I want Don, he just wrote a book on this. This is awesome. All right. When the thousand year reign is over, uh, there's a judge, a final, well, first of all, Satan is loose for a short period of time. At the end of the thousand years, he <clears throat> gathers people, believe it or not, who were born during the millennial period, who actually will follow him. Uh, that, the, that's an, another Gog and Magog uh, battle. God will destroy those armies. And then you've got the final judgments. And Revelation chapter 20, verses 10 to 15, talks about the great white throne judgment. That's, and it's quite an awesome sight. All the believers who have ever been born will be raised. Not told what kind of form they'll be in, but they'll all be raised from the dead and they'll stand before God and the books will be open. Another book's open called the Book of Life and whoever name is not found written in the Book of Life, they'll be sent to the lake of fire forever and ever. The same lake of fire that the devil, the beast, and the false prophet have already been cast into. That is hell. That is the final judgment for every human being who has rejected the gospel of Christ or the message in the Old Testament. So that's what's going to happen after the millennium. Then when that's over, then the great news of Revelation chapter 21, when the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, a new heaven and a new earth are created, and we're going to be with the Lord forever and ever and ever. In the land, yeah, in the... Um, <laughs> in, the, in the land of fadeless day, there is no sun, no moon, no night, and the gates are always open. We'll be coming in, and the Lord will be there. We will be his people. He will be our God, and we will dwell with him forever and ever and ever. Isn't that great? And that's the future for us. <laughs> Heaven. Have you ever heard uh, your kid or your grandkids say, I wish this day would never end? <laughs> yeah. Um, that time that Don just described is called the day of God. It's forever. It's one day. Sun never sets, as he just said a moment right. ago. We have no idea what that's going to be like. We know that Paul the Apostle alluded to the fact that it would, it would be improper, probably even vulgar, for him to try to tell or write the things that he saw regarding eternity. That it's, it's, there's no human words and he knew a lot of languages. There are no human words that could describe what heaven is all about. I love the fact of the contrast of what we're seeing in this world. This world's messed up. It's dying. It's hurting. It's coming apart at the seams. Don't lose heart over that, friends. Don't lose heart. I always want to remind this church, Jesus said there'd be days like this. Because our God knows in advance, even though these things are horrible, what's happening? We don't panic. We look up. We don't lose hope but we get excited about what's taking place. Listen, we have room for maybe one more? For those of you who are not able to read this, when Jesus was God, why did he not know when he would return, referring to Matthew 24, 36? Awesome question, wonderful answer. The answer blesses my heart off the charts. In theology, there's something called kenosis. Mm -hmm. Kenosis, K-E-N-O-S-I-S. -S. Do you remember when Jesus told Peter, Peter, put away your sword. Don't you know I could call down 12 legions of angels to take care of me? Do you remember when Jesus 
subjected himself, as I referred to earlier tonight, the temptations of the devil? Couldn't Jesus have snapped his finger and destroyed Satan in a second? Easily. That's called kenosis. Mm -hmm. it, it means that when Jesus came, please get this. When Jesus came as a human being, do you understand he was 100% God and at the exact same time 100% man without sin nature? He didn't have the nature to sin. But did you know he had the nature to feel exactly what it feels to be tempted, like you're tempted? Did you know that when, when Jesus walked along a stone path and, and uh, stepped on a, ro a sharp rock, that he felt it just like you do? Do you know, listen, seriously, I mean this with all reverence. Jesus felt hunger pains. Jesus knows what it's like to, to have to go to the bathroom. Jesus, Mary had to change his diapers, ladies and gentlemen. Why? Because you and I needed our diapers changed. In, el, in every point, in all points, he was tempted just like we are, yet without sin. So listen, kenosis is this. This is, to me, is what meekness personifies. Jesus, in his kenosis, it is a willful determination of himself to bring himself, only God can do this, to bring himself under the complete subjection of the Father in his humanity, in his will. He goes to the garden and prays, Father, if it be thy will, remove this cup from me. He prays how many times? Three times, no answer, but he's strengthened by angels. And from that moment on, notice the whole tempo changes. Jesus goes to the cross with full-blown boldness and victory. You notice that? The battle was in the garden. The great emptying out, the kenosis, is that Jesus, listen, Jesus willfully of his own determination laid aside certain things that would benefit him so that he would suffer like you and I would suffer. When Jesus said, I don't know, or when Luke tells us that he grew in the grace and knowledge of God and, and, and favor with man, how could he do this? Because Jesus allowed himself in his emptying out to learn to go to synagogue, to learn to go through the scriptures because we have to also. He, he, it's absolutely awesome. And yet at any moment, he could have said, you know what, I'm going to do this. And he, he would have been right. He could have. But he chose, and to me, that is the, one of the most ultimate displays of power, is to not pick up the tool or to not fix the situation when you have the power to do it. And he endured that for your salvation. I just absolutely love your question. Great question. Yeah. Um... Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, he who knew no sin mm. became a sin offering on our behalf so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He did that for you and for me. He died as our substitute so we don't have to suffer. The penalty of the sins of the world was placed upon Jesus. He willingly took it because someday he knew that you, 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 you and, and Jack and I would be there with him. That's called the love of God, and that's why we love him so very, very much. <laughs> that's right. Next question. When will the battle of Ezekiel 38 of Gog and Magog happen? Will it be before or after the rapture of the church? Uh, I don't know. Uh, that's a great question. I'm, I'm going to be happy either way. But with what we're seeing in the news right now, this is my, is it, it's just us here right now, right? I'll just tell you exactly what I, what I, I'll tell you what I think. I personally think that as we're watching Russia deeply now entrenched, most recent news, now Turkey piling on. Did you know the House of Togomar has got to get on board? We need Ethiopia. Don't we need Ethiopia to get involved? Northern Sudan. So, Northern Sudan. That's right, the region. Okay, so here's the thing. The Ezekiel battle, I'm actually expecting to wake up any day uh, and, and watching and seeing on, on the news of, 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 of weaponry, formation movements, something going on. The only thing that I would put in front of that, there's, there's only two things I'd put in front of that. I'm expecting a trigger. I think everything's so tense right now in the Middle East that something's gonna, someone's going to trip over something, so to speak. Something's going to go down. I think we got a hint of it last week. When Israel flew into Syria and took out that facility, that, what'd you call it earlier, of research? They were making bombs. They yeah, were making yeah, bombs. They, yeah. killed, they killed Iranians and some North Koreans yeah. and some Russians. 
I'm expecting something to happen in Damascus. Even if, even if, the, even if ISIS trips something and blows something up, Israel's going to get blamed for it. There's going to be something that's going to cause Israel or Russia and others to, to go against. So I'm looking for the destruction of Damascus based upon Isaiah 17. I'm expecting Ezekiel to start. And um, before that all could happen, I, I believe that the Lord could come back for the church tonight. So I'm so excited. Regardless, we are so close to seeing something really big happen. And I think the things that are taking place in the world with Pakistan threatening now India with a nuclear bomb and North Korea threatening the world, how many more warning signs do we have to get? Not to pick a date, but how about today? <laughs> Just get ready. Just be ready. Well, what if he doesn't come for a month? You'll be ready now. And if you get hit by a truck, you'll be ready. It works. It works. Be ready. Yeah, one of the things that's so horrific about all the nonsense about the September 23rd thing, it's misdirected people from looking at the real signs that are taking place yeah. in Syria, oh, in Lebanon, with Russians, point. Turks, and Iranians all there near the, near the Israeli border, you know, setting up, uh, having a supply line all the way from Tehran to Beirut, all the way from Tehran to Damascus, where they can put troops and munitions there. So some they they can invade Israel, not coming all the way from Iran, but coming right over the northern border of Israel, mm -hmm. the Golan Heights and the Syrian Golan. And so that's the real story. And the problem is, you've got the nonsense like the September 23rd, everybody's looking at that, saying, oh, that's predicted by the Bible. No, it isn't. But what is predicted the Bible is taking place right now in the northern border of Israel on the southern part of Syria and Lebanon, when the stage is being set for all of this. And, and again, there's misdirection there that's going on, where we've got people looking at the wrong thing when the signs are literally Jack being fulfilled right it's in front awesome. of our very eyes. It's awesome. Um, so you guys pray for our nation. Yeah. Pray for our nation for this reason. Greatest thing that we can do as a nation um, is turn back to God. And the church needs to lead the way. The, the church should not look outside the window and point at the world and how bad it is. Yeah. First of all, the world is supposed to be bad. Remember, it's where you came from. It's where I came from. <laughs> So we need to stop looking at the world and, and telling them how bad they are. They already know how bad they are. We need to pray for the church. We need to turn our finger inward. And the body of Christ needs to repent for one thing. It needs to repent of its sloppy Bible study. It needs to repent of its idolatry and get back to Jesus as being the, the hot, burning passion of our lives that motivate, that his, our love for him motivates everything that we say and do. And the pulpits in God's churches in America, they need to get back to the truth of preaching the true, unadulterated gospel. That's what, that, that's what needs to happen. There needs to be a revival because you know what? Things are going to come. And what is, our thing, what is our motive to point out everything on a map or road sign? The ultimate thing, honestly, is to bring every man and woman, boy and girl possible with us to the kingdom of God, that they might know the forgiveness and the love of God. And so the church needs to get ready to meet the bridegroom cometh, Maranatha. Maranatha. We need to get our gown out. We need to get it cleaned up and stop messing around. Stop playing Christianity on Sunday. Get, there's, God is talking to some of you, or if not all of us, get out of these certain things that you have in your life. Get ready to meet me. I've never seen a bride. We've done church, uh, weddings all over the place. And I, you watch a bride come down this aisle. And man, her dress isn't ripped. It's not dirty. She's not out there rolling around in the mud before she comes down the aisle. She's not only immaculate. She's got all these ladies in waiting that are picking every little thing off of her. She looks amazing. And then the lighting's just right and everything. And then the people stand. Everybody's ready. The music plays. And she comes walking down. And you know he's about ready to faint. Uh, she's never looked so good. And uh, listen, we need to take a cue from her. We need to get ready. We need to get all this stuff. This is one thing that Don and I are very concerned about. There's a lot of people running around watching and, and participating in the prophecy, what's up next game, and they don't even know who Jesus is, really. They have no walk with God. They don't go to a church. They, they're not serving anywhere. So they don't go to church. Churches are messed up. Churches will always be messed up so long as there's people in attendance. That's right. Churches have warts and bruises, and, and, and it, it's called a family. That's why we don't all get along. We're related to each other. 
It's a family. We need to be, we need to be the church. And uh, we, we need to keep that in mind. You guys, I'm going to ask all of you to stand if you would. We've got 52 seconds to pray. <laughs> I hope tonight has been a blessing. We have no idea. We won't know until we hear back from you if, uh, if this was any good or not. But okay. If any of this meant anything to you, the greatest thing for, for you to do is to go, to go to my Facebook site and make a comment. Just be honest. Say it. It stunk. Don't do it again. Or, yeah, you know what? Uh, maybe next month. So... Don and I have made schedule plans, right, just in case. Yes, We've got two more coming, two more, two more if need be. We're hoping the rapture happens, but if not, yeah. uh, so, so October 25? No? October 25th and November 15th. Yep. Is that right? Something like that. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned. Father, we thank you for tonight. Lord, I thank you for my brother who, my goodness, I forget. I forget how long it's been. Um, some 30 plus. years? 30 plus years? Father, I, I just, it's amazing for me. I, it's such a treat for me to be on a platform with him when I used to sit in his Bible studies at Costa Mesa as a, just a little believer. And God, I thank you for Don and his love for the truth. I thank you, God, that you made this guy a genius. He, he, he's forgotten more than I'll ever know. And Father, that you keep them safe, healthy, strong, and usable. And Lord, together we just pray for all of your people who are out in the sanctuary and beyond. God, that you would galvanize them to these days, amazing times. Lord, that people would know that we know you because not only our love for one another, but our love for the lost. Our love for community, to reach out, Lord, to our, our local governments, to ask them if they need any help. Lord, we see the church rising in Florida, rising in Texas. God, even before any disaster strikes Southern California, may all the churches that we represent tonight, may we even go to them and get ready to say, how can I help in the time of need? How can I be ready for you? Lord, we thank you for the opportunities to share the love of Jesus. And so, Father God, we praise you now and all God's people. Church, let's stand, if you would, and turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews 8, I don't know if you guys realize it or not, but did you know the last time... Uh, we were together, which was not last Wednesday night, but the Wednesday night before that. We set a world's record here. Did you know that? We did chapter 7 in one, one night. <laughs> that, never has that ever happened here before. It's 33 years. It's never happened. And uh, so tonight we'll be looking at Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. We'll go as far as we can. We're looking at really the same theme. It goes this way for quite a while. And that is having a priest better than you. You always want to make sure that you have a priest that's better than you. But then when you turn, if you turn to a human, and you assume that that priest is better than you, then you're going to be set up for great disappointment and failure. Are you listening to me? Have I ever asked you to put your eyes on me and follow me in any way, shape, or form? The only thing that I would possibly flirt with doing is what Paul said. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. I might say, follow me as I follow Paul as he follows Christ. We'll all be following Jesus together. But the Bible makes it very clear that your priest must be a priest of a very, very particular order. He must have certain requirements, certain standards, certain things that he has to meet to be the priest of your soul and your eternal life. And oh, a small detail. He can't be of this world. He has to be the eternal God who has come down from heaven above. I'll read the verse 1, if you'll pick up and start in verse 2. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Wow. For every high priest, think of every priest on earth, of every religion, of any denomination. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts 
and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one, referring to Christ, also have something to offer. That's awesome. Verse 5, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, quote now, God speaking to him, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Having a priest better than you. It's, it's amazing because all of us can agree on this one thing, no matter what your spiritual walk of life is, that there's an overwhelming sense, and, and it has been since Adam and Eve were created, throughout all of culture, anthropologists, sociologists, those who have studied antiquities, there, there is this consistent theme in the disciplines of those sciences that man is religious by nature. Did you know that? It is unnatural for man to be atheistic. I want you to know that. Atheism is a modern time construct. There were no atheists in ancient times. It was something that was an, inve- it was an invention and it came out of an era which, by the way, cracks me up, Because if you look at the tenets of atheism, they are actually a religion. For example, one of them, most famous, I don't know if he's the most famous, he's kind of gone off the rails uh, of late, nobody really mentions him anymore because it's pretty debunked, but uh, Chuck Darwin, for example. Charles Darwin. Um, Did you know he started out his career in a seminary, learning the Bible. Did you know that? But uh, he didn't like God, and so he went about a way to explain the world in, in, in other ways. And the things that he claimed literally took more faith to believe in than just believing in what God had said about things. When God says, I made, for example, the, the fowl of the air, birds, and I made them after their own kind. In other words, God says, I made birds, and I wrote their DNA out, and within them there's variation. There's a blue one, there's a yellow one, there's a red one, there's a big one, there's a small one, and all over time, as time has gone on, there's still birds. Well, how do you explain, how do you explain dogs? There's chihuahuas, and there's, listen, when you... If you take the DNA course and you go backwards in that course, you come to an animal, which is a dog, which is somewhat much like a wolf. And it's man who is engineered from what exists into other forms of what? Dogs. Dogs. You've never taken a dog and made a cat. Okay, you can't get a fish and make it fly like a bird. Everything still to this moment is replicated after its own kind, exactly as God has said. And in that, by the way, is the human. And the human, I know this sounds corny, we've heard it a thousand times, but it's true. The human has a God-shaped hole in their existence. Right in the middle of your chest, so to speak, is a, is a big hole that only God can fit. And when we don't use the Word of God to find God then we go around trying to stuff that hole with things that we think might fulfill. And so we'll have it up to here with sex, or we'll have it up to here with drink, or seeking pleasure, or adrenaline, you know? Jumping off of mountains, bridges, stuff, the adrenaline rush. It doesn't matter. Uh, Whatever it is, you're looking for this filler, And um, I'm not saying that when God fills that hole, you suddenly go boring. You don't jump off of buildings anymore because you're a Christian. Sure, I'm sure you do. Some of you are Christians. You jump out of airplanes. I don't know why you'd jump out of a perfectly good airplane, but uh, it doesn't mean that you become a Christian and you don't have a life anymore. The exact opposite happens. You become a Christian and become fulfilled. 
And then you start living your life. Believe it or not, with all the jumping out of airplanes or uh, swimming with sharks that you're trying to get a rush out of, um, at the end of the day, it's still over. But never with Jesus. And so heaven high priest better than you, we start looking at this. Uh, We look at it this way in verses 1 and 2, and that is having a better covenant. Write that down, please. A covenant. According to the Bible, God has written us a new covenant. There was the Old Covenant, and there's the New Covenant. There was the Old Testament, and there's the New Testament. One one does not contradict the other. They're in perfect harmony. But one promises something, and the other fulfills the promise. They work in tandem. Are you with me? They work in tandem. Never. I mean it. I would never go to a church that sees the Old and New Testament as something that should be separated and never taught, studied, or looked at. No way. You can't do that. You have no idea what it is you believe in the New Testament unless you've studied the Old. Okay? Very, very, very important. So as we look at this, we'll kind of dissect this together with the time that we have. Mark this down if you would. we're, We're out to have a better covenant because of what he's given us, but we must come to the conclusion from Scripture, and you will eventually if you haven't, is that Jesus Christ is, in fact, that better covenant. See, so what's the big deal about that? Well, because it's not written in stone. It's not based on a lineage of priesthood. It's not, it's not listed on uh, or determined upon uh, this rank of order or these um, special DNA groups of people. The Kohathites, the Levites, or, uh, you know, today people might say, uh, oh, you know, he, he's, a, he's a priest, he's a cardinal, he's a, a pope, he's an a archbishop, or she's a nun, or he's, he's this, or he's this type of priest in this organization, or this group. It's, listen, God's not into that. Do you understand that? He's not into that. I don't mean to upset anybody. But Jesus made it very clear. He said, whatever you do, don't call anybody on earth father. Because there's only one father, and that's your father in heaven. That's what Jesus said. Crystal clear. And when you you think about that, um, there is the reaching out in arms of God saying to you, come to me. He has never said in the Bible... Go read it. He has never said in the Bible, you go go to those people, and then you can come to me. If you think of the Old Testament, really getting down to it, the priesthood, a friend of mine told me, and he's Jewish, so he can say this. I, I don't think I would ever say this. But we were talking about this very thing, and he's Jewish, and he said, listen, he said the, the, the priesthood was a glorified butcher shop. He said, the priests, the Kohathites and the Levites, they were glorified butchers. And if you've ever read Leviticus, if you ever want to fall asleep, (laughs) read Leviticus. Take the spleen, put it over here, then stretch out the entrails, and and it's just like, what? I'd knock you out in a minute. Why all that? Because it was God communicating to his people that you can't keep the law. And so because of that, Innocent animals have got to be sacrificed to make atonement for your sins. And their offering would be a covering for your sin. Fast forward, we've got the Lord Jesus Christ, who, when John the Baptist saw him, John, a Jew, Yohanin, chapter 1, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. All priests of the earth and all animal blood of the earth only covers sins. No priest can take away your sins. Did you know that? No priest can. You say, I don't know if I like hearing this, but it's true because the Bible makes it clear. The only way that you could have your sins taken away from you is if your priest that you're confessing to has no sin. It even says in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, that the priests that operate in this world, they, before they represent you, must first get blood for themselves to have their sins forgiven before they can come and talk to you. Wow, do you remember in the Old Testament that when the 
priest was going to go into the Holy of Holies, they tied a rope around his leg and they put bells on his robe because if there was sin in his life after he had confessed his sins, and can you imagine on the Day of Atonement, there's your man, there he goes, the whole nation's waiting, go in there and talk to God so that our sins are covered. Okay, here I go. And he would go in with blood into the tabernacle and then it would be the temple in Jerusalem. He would go and you would hear the bells moving. Ding, 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 ding. Right, really? And then he would, do, he would offer, and then after a while, if, if you didn't hear any tinkling of the bells, you get a little concerned. Can you imagine? Hey, have, you, have, you, have we heard anything lately? I haven't heard a thing. Have you heard any tinkling? Anything? No? Pull on the rope. Can you imagine reeling this guy in? He couldn't come into the presence of God with sin in his life. Well, think about that, by the way. That's a bit convicting if you think about it maybe in your life right now. God says, if you're my child, you're also in the priesthood. And I don't want you to come into my presence with sin in your life. He wants us to walk a life of holiness. That's not boring. It's thrilling. It simply means this, that you walk before him. Because we have a covenant that we don't have to run back. Can you imagine in the Old Testament era, if you sinned, five minutes, you left. You just made an offering and you walk away. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You slip and fall and some, something happens and you sin. Oh, man, you got to grab. It depends on the sin. You got to grab a, a, a goat or a ram or a lamb or a turtle dove and you got to go back. Hey, here, priest, I blew it. Here's some more blood. How bloody was that? Did you know that Josephus, the historian that was working for Rome, he said that during the Passover weekend that Jesus Christ was crucified, that he estimated that there were some 285,000 sheep sacrificed at the temple on that weekend. Because you had to have 10 people per sheep. That's how they knew how many people were in Jerusalem at Passover. And on a lonely hill, at the north top of the Moriah, the lamb was being crucified. And so verse 1 says, now this is the main point. I love this by the author. This is the main point. (laughs) He's saying, I'm getting down to the whole reason of the whole thing, that we have such a high priest. I've got that marked in my Bible. This is the point. What's the point? We've got such a high priest. We've got a priest that handles everything that you and I need. By the way, in my notes, I have high priest, that's Jesus Christ, who, notice his location, is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavenlies, or in heaven. Where's Jesus Christ? He's seated at the right hand of the majesty. That's the priest that I have. Is that the priest that you have? Is that the one that you talk to constantly? You don't have to bring blood. You don't have to go and and offer something. And he doesn't speak back, by the way, and and say to you, now, to really get forgiveness or get this taken care of, you've got to do three of these and seven of the others, and you've got to earn a little bit of this. You've got to have some skin in the game, friend. You can't do that. That is an insult to Christ's sacrifice. He doesn't need my help. He doesn't need your help. We've got the priest. We've got the one. The very one you need. The one that you've known all along down inside is the one that you really ought to have. It's Jesus, my friend. It's nobody else. It is Jesus Christ. We have such a high priest. Man, as a Bible teacher, I'm thinking, just that theme alone, you could preach a message for months. We have such a high priest that forgives. We have such a high priest that endures. We have such a high priest that will never turn his back on you. We have such a high priest that can forgive any sin. We have have such a high priest that's always listening. We have such a high priest that's always there, always caring, always tender, always waiting, always there, at all times he's there. In the morning when you wake up, 
He's there. And all night through, you'll be sleeping. He's there. He never leaves. He says he never leaves. He comes into your life and he never leaves. You have to go somewhere. We got to go. We got to go to confession. We got to go to the temple. We got to go to the church. We got to go to the mosque or we've got to go to the synagogue. We got to go. Where do you got to go? What? I will never forget. It broke my heart. Was witnessing to a man in Moscow, Russia, witnessing. His eyes are being opened, everything, and we get ready to pray. And I said, you know, do you want to accept Christ? Yes, I do. Okay, here we go. We're going to pray right now. He goes, we can't pray here. We cannot pray. We I said, what are you talking about? He goes, we have to go inside the church. Only then God can hear us. And I said, man, come, listen, the whole time I've been talking to you about this, we're not talking about God being a mouse. We're not him talking about being uh, something little, something that is any way bound. And it took forever. I've got to tell you, the guy eventually prayed, but it was tough for him. He couldn't believe that God lived outside the church. Listen, I'm happy to report that God lives outside the church. Thank God. In fact, if you want to find God, there's many churches, you ought to go outside and look for him. But notice this place of position. The Bible says that our high priest is already seated. He's all done. He's done it all. I say this with all due respect and affection. He's got nothing to do. Because he's done it all. When he said it's finished. On the cross, Jesus said it is finished. That means everything that was needed to be done to save your soul, Jesus did it. Wow, love that. That's why Jesus Christ is the better covenant. It's not on stones. It's not on two tablets. It's Christ. Those tablets only pointed man's sins to Christ. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. Boy, let me tell you, Hebrews 1, verse 2 ought to just shut down right now people saying, God told me to tell you, and it's completely off the wall crazy. In these last days, God spoke to us by his Son. God is done speaking. When he speaks, he speaks through his word that he has given. You want something? I just need to have a word. Uh, there's many gazillions of thousands of them right here. Why don't you read them? Oh, I just need to get a word from God. How many words does he need to give you? <laughs> search and see. Doesn't, the, doesn't he say search? And when you have searched for me with all of your heart, I'll be found by you. I love that. See, I don't know if I've got the strength or the energy. Trust me. Search after him. You say, I don't know if I believe. That's fair. Search after him and find out. This disprove his existence. Go for it. But listen, don't be surprised if as you're looking around and you know you'll see the curtain, there'll be a foot sticking out from underneath the curtain, and it and it'll be a sandal. You'll it'll be Jesus' sandal. Because if you search for him, he'll make sure you catch him. He doesn't say, hey, uh, count to 10 and, and try to find me. I'll be, uh, I'll be here. And you start counting and he, and he leaves the house and goes down a couple miles away. He doesn't, doesn't do that. He wants to be caught by you. What a priest. In this incredibly new and awesome covenant that is made in his blood by his love and power and through him established forever. Well, listen, Hebrews 1, verse 2 goes on to say, Has in these last days spoken us to by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the worlds. You know, see that word worlds? That's, we would say, cause, it's hard, it's, it's bad English, but it's cosmoses. Multiple cosmos. He made them all. Whatever is made has been made by him. That's everything. All of it. 
beyond the farthest. Did you guys get it? I, I, I kind of posted it too late. You had like three minutes. I posted it the other night to go outside quick and look into the northwestern sky to watch Falcon 9 be launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base. Did anybody do that? It was awesome. I don't know where you were, but I was in a really clear spot, and man, that thing took off, and we're watching it. I've got the, got the phone open, because we got all the technology on the phone. You can see the speed and the altitude and, and all of this stuff, and, you're, and we're watching it, and it's just amazing, huge flame, and it's going up 8,000 miles an hour, 11,000 miles an hour, 17,000 miles an hour, and we watched it with our naked eye. We watched it to, to where it was, had past Mexico City. Amen. From here. And you're just like, wow. <laughs> and to think of that speed and what, what is it like out there. God knows. He made it. And if that thing went for a bazillion years in that direction, it'd still be, it's, it would still be under the jurisdiction of of Almighty God. <laughs> I love it. But that verse goes on. First uh, chapter of Hebrews, it says in verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory, speaking of Jesus, and the expressed image of his person, and upholding all things by the power of his, or by the word of his power, when he had by himself, he hello everybody, what? By himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Amen. Sounds like Hebrews, doesn't it? What we're reading right now in this chapter, same as echoed in the first chapter. Sat down. He purged our sins by himself. I love that. Man, how saved can we be? Well, if you put your faith in Christ alone and nothing else, because there is nothing else, uh, you're, listen, he's got your name written in his Lamb's Book of Life. And what's awesome about that fact is that no one's blotted out of the Lamb's Book of Life. I don't want to go down a rabbit hole here, but real quick. There's, two, there's at least two books in the Bible that record names. Technically, I could push it and, and show you a few others, but there's the Lamb's Book of Life and there's the Book of Life. Every human being ever given life has their name written in the book of life. See, so if you're here right now and you, you, you're not a Christian and, you, and let's say we know this, that in time you'll never become one. You'll die and wind up in hell. Your name was written in the book of life. God gave you life. But because you never accepted Christ, your name was never written down in the Lamb's book of life. So remember, think of two spreadsheets right here. All the people that have ever been born or that have ever been given life. Think about all the names that God, only God knows of all the babies that were miscarried in life or aborted in life. God knows them all. Did you know that? He tells us so in Psalm 139. He says, I knew all, I knew all your body parts before they even put together. I, he said, I was in the womb while you were being plugged, plugged into, like, you know, Legos. <laughs> arm, arm put in, nose. He said, I was there. Every human being ever given life, so watch this. But the Bible says that there is the Lamb's book of life, and that's the book where those who believe in Christ, their names are written. Lamb's book of life. The book of the Lamb's record, we would call it. So, Here's my name, Jack, okay? I was given life, and at the age of 19, so to speak, I'm making this part up right now. Are you with me, everybody? Yes. When I said, Lord, forgive me of my sins, come into my life, take control, he highlighted my name. He took the mouse, he highlighted my name. Are you? I told you I was making this part up. He hit copy. He came over to the Lamb's Book of Life and he hit paste. 
Watch. Where's my name now? Both places. In the day of judgment, if your name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life, your name is blotted out of the book of life. It says so. Your name, when the books are open and it says your name's not there, it means that you're on your, you're, you're momentarily, the door's going to open up and you're going to fall. Why? Because you didn't get your name copied and pasted into the Lamb's Book of Life. To get your name into the Lamb's Book of Life is to say, Jesus Christ is Lord. He died on the cross for my sins. He rose again from the dead. I trust him. I believe him. I don't want religion. I want Jesus. And I've given him my life. And I commit my life to him. And I'm going to get up and I'm going to live for him. I'm not going to live for anybody else but him. He's the Lord of my life. He calls the shots. We're going to do what he wants to do. And listen, if you do that, hang on. Because it's going to be a glorious ride. It's going to be a great life. Man. Also in verse 1 it says, now this is the main point. He's stressing. Don't miss this. Absolutely amazing. I love the fact that he is seated at the right hand. Now, verse 2 continues. Jesus Christ is the better architect. He's not only the better covenant, he's the better architect. When the Bible says in verse 2, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord, that is Jesus Christ, erected and not man. I find this absolutely awesome. Here's the reason why. Look, he's the minister. The minister is the one, listen, a minister is not only a servant, but he also administers what is the applied or the appropriate thing. In other words, this minister, who was the high priest, knows exactly what to do and give you in life. I love it. Can you trust him with that? Really? Honestly? I just prayed with a family just before service, and their daughter's going in for surgery. And the dad had expressed boy, this has been a journey. And because you could tell, and he's a good dad, you could tell. Uh, he wants to know all about this and he wants to have a little bit of control because he loves these, these kids and his daughter is going to go in for surgery. And, and uh, it was cute because he said, I made sure that I uh, looked at the team that's going to be working on my daughter and made sure that none of them were criminals or had any <laughs> bad records, any marks against them. What was, he, what was he expressing? A loving dad. That's how dads think. Who are you? <laughs> Hi, sir. Can I date your daughter? No. <laughs> Not till you and I become friends. Sit down. <laughs> that's how it starts. Very cordial. So that's, but, um, but a minister. And he's, look, he's the one that there applies all that we need in the sanctuary. Not this sanctuary. Not any sanctuary on earth. I'm happy to report. Of the true tabernacle. This gets fun. Listen, friends. If you're, if you're bound up in, in, in church membership and that's your entrance to heaven, big disappointment coming. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if, if you're a Mormon and you are trusting in your book, the, uh, uh, the, the book being checked off for the basic performances in, in your achievements to reach uh, deity, big, big disappointment coming. Uh, if you're a Catholic and you're trusting in, in, in all of the rites and pa the rituals and this and the catechism and the and the confirmations and the baptisms big listen if you're a protestant and you think that you got the corner market on on going to heaven because if it's anything other than what Jesus Christ has done we're all in trouble friends and so when it says here, the tabernacle, or the true tabernacle, this is absolutely beautiful, because friends, Jesus never went into any sanctuary on earth, and he never went into any tabernacle on earth, and he saw to it 
that he didn't do that. Do you know how many times Jesus Christ visited the temple in Jerusalem and never went in? He never went in. He stayed in the outer court. Did you know that? Every time. He never went in. Don't you think if he was God, right, and this all meant something at the building and the temple, that he would go through, he'd tell the high priest, scoot over, I'm here, get out of the way. I know this better than you do. And walks in, don't you think he would have done it? He never did it. He made it a point not to do it. You want to know why? That big building was coming down in 70 A.D., And if that building came down in 70 A.D., so would have your salvation. No. He entered a sanctuary in a tabernacle, the true one, which is in heaven. Look what it says. Which the Lord, that is Jesus Christ himself, erected, not man. I mean, we can party over that statement right there. According to the Bible, this great high priest, Jesus went into a sanctuary, into the tabernacle, to secure your salvation, and that location was not made with human hands. I like that. Not made with human hands. You know, I told you before, and you know this, that Jesus was the carpenter. The word in Greek is... Tecton, and it appears only once regarding the life of Jesus in the Bible as carpenter or craftsman. We have no idea what he built exactly. People want to pretend. We don't know. But it's, he could have worked with stone. He could have worked with wood and stone. Did he make a table? I don't know. He was a carpenter. He's a craftsman. Maybe people need tables. Chairs? Yokes for animals? Those had to be made out of wood. Did he make uh, mangers? You know, mangers had to be made out of stone, not wood. Stone. Um, On and on it goes. We don't know. But we know this. According to the Bible, there's a tabernacle and there's a sanctuary in heaven not made with human hands. (laughs) I'm, I'm really glad about that. Uh, in my notes, I've got uh, God and Son, you know, like God and Son Construction Company, or God and Son, <laughs> God and Son and Company. We're the company. It's God and Son, and then he invites us as believers to work with him, to, to invite others to come to Christ. That, that's our part. Matthew 6, 13. Um, so we'll just pause the clock right here. Right? You have nowhere to go. Only a moment has gone by since we started. <laughs> Matthew 6, 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, which is one of my favorite places, gorgeous, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And so they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Mark this, everyone. What's the issue? Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. What? What is it that flesh and blood has not revealed? Jesus is the Son of God. You all hear that? Jesus is saying to Peter, I want, you to, I want you to pass this logic test right now. This is very important, eternally important. Jesus says to Peter, flesh and blood did not tell you that. What, what you just said, that's not from human thought. But my Father who is in heaven. Got that, everybody? The big deal is, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, that's not from this world. My Father gave you that. That's the point. And also, and I also say to you, that you are Peter. Peter's name means uh, stone. And on this rock, I will build my church. That's interesting. That's a different word than Peter. 
On what will Jesus build his church? Peter? If Jesus builds his church on Peter, we're going to hell. Because Peter denies Christ. Peter's always fumbling the ball. We love Peter because he's just like us. Bumbling around, making mistakes. We love him. He's our favorite disciple. We can relate to Peter. But listen, Peter is not salvation, friend. I know Peter. Well, how do you... Well, I, I have a statue. I pray to Peter. Uh, yeah, the Bible says you're not praying to Peter. No, no, I am. No, no, you're not. Well, I, 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 I have a statue of this. My mom had all the statues. And uh, necklaces and things. And back in my day, when, I mean, I was never a Catholic, and I did, at that point I didn't believe in God in junior high and high school, but everybody had to have a St. Christopher around your neck or you couldn't surf. It was an international law. If you didn't have him, you couldn't go surfing. And every, do you know what I'm talking about, anybody? No, not true. See this, listen, I, you've, this has been the traditions of men in your life. You've been ingrained to think this way. Why would you talk to someone who cannot hear you, who's not even supposed to hear you, and couldn't do anything about what they heard? When the Bible says there's one mediator between God and man, that is Christ Jesus, the man. The man, Christ Jesus, okay? Very important. I hope this is liberating to some people because I know some people are saying, wait a minute, my mind is blowing right now. I understand that, but stick with the Bible. We know this for sure. There is a minister, one, who is the high priest, who intercedes for you, represents you in a sanctuary, in a tabernacle that's not made with human hands. That means Calvary Chapel Chino Hills is ruled out, and so is the Vatican. So is Red Square, and so is the Taj Mahal. So is the Hagia Sophia. You name it. All of them are ruled out. Only leaves heaven. Is your priest in heaven? Mine's in heaven, right where I need him. I don't want to talk to a priest here when the issue needs to be settled up there. I want to talk to my priest who's up there who simply turns and says, Hey, Dad, Jack's got a problem. I got it covered. Taken care of. <laughs> I have to end. I have to end. I don't want to end. Uh, let me see if I can. Uh, um, that means when we worship, pray, and gather together. Those are spiritual actions, people. When we pray, worship, and get together, those are supernatural events. I'm telling you right now, listen, I know it's a post-COVID world, but the next big thing coming, according to, according to God's word, we can never stop meeting together. We can never stop praying. We can never stop worshiping. Those three things are supernatural events. I know our politicians don't think so, but we really don't care because, listen, they're not going to save us. Okay? No, nobody's writing in. No Messiah is going to be from the state capitol or from uh, or Washington, D.C. or Air Force One. You got that? The thing, is, the thing is this. When we pray, when we worship, and when we gather, it's a supernatural event. That's why I'm trusting God for the Honda Center to be a church. Why? Because we're inviting people to come back because they've been away. Fear got out of the habit. I, it sounds weird, right? It sounds weird, though. I, I've just got out of the habit. The habit? Like a, like a burger place? <laughs> oh, no, no, man. I just got out of the habit of going to church. I didn't know, you, I didn't know God was a habit. Isn't it your life? Well, I haven't been me. I've been, I've been doing church at home. No, 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 you're not. No, you can't. You can't do that. Honestly, listen. You can watch from home. 
Just like you can drive down the freeway and listen to a radio sermon. You're being taught. But you're not a church until you have to fight to get a seat. <laughs> you're not a church until you're not a church until the person next to you says, Hey, will you pray for me? Because I'm I'm hurting. You're not at church until you're experiencing what the scripture calls a convocation. A convocation is when the church comes together in unison, tangibly. And I'm going to get a lot of letters, which are going to be totally bogus about, I want you to know, I want... Now look, if you live in a place where there's no churches, God's grace is there for you, and he knows this. But if you are within driving distance of a church, and you're, you're out of the habit of going, Amen. not good. Why? Hebrews 10.25 says, you have forsaken the assembling together of the saints and you are going to fall victim to the perils of the end times. Don't do it. I know this is hard stuff for somebody who's grown really comfortable. But God wants you to get together with his people, warts and all. Well, that guy smells. I understand, but you probably smell compared to the person next to you. Well, it's not easy going to church. Got to get up. I know that's a tough one. Brush your teeth, clothes, present yourself. People have been doing it for thousands of years. You can do it. Well, my kids are used to sleeping in. Cold water. Listen, you got to get them ready for getting a job someday, and church is a good way to get it started. They got to get up. And besides that, don't, listen, besides that, I think it's George Barna, and I got to end because I'm way past. I might, it might be George Barna. Somebody can help me later and get that data, and then maybe you can post it on, on this message later. But I think George Barna is the one who post-COVID research showed that the suicide rates among people who faithfully attended church during COVID, suicide rates were unaffected, zip. No, really, I'm serious. People who, people who bailed out on God, lost hope, wound up losing their lives. Why? Listen, you disconnected from your great priest. No, walk toward him. Don't walk away from him. Get closer to him. Get closer to him. Father, Father, we pray. We thank you that right now you're hearing us. And Lord, somebody who's very, and I get it, somebody who's very, very caught up into the liturgical practices and just an ecumenical routine finds a message like this even offensive. Because we, we've, we've made, or you've allowed us to experience you. And it's more comfortable for them for you to be distant. But you don't like that. And Lord, the truth is, when we love, when we as humans love someone or something, we don't like distance either. How dare we impose our will upon you to try to make you into something manageable? You are the living God, the eternal, almighty and you're the one who said, call me Abba, call me Papa. Come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will take your burden from you. Learn from me. What I give you, my yoke and my burden, it is light and it is easy. So tonight, friend, whoever, wherever you may be, You can say right now, right where you're at, Lord Jesus, transform my life. Look, I don't care right now if you are somewhere in a monastery in some foreign land and you're listening to this message in secret. Right where you're at in your isolation, you can say it right now. You can say, Lord Jesus Christ, come into my life. What's wrong? Listen, why can't you say that? Why won't you say it? You're afraid. You're afraid that he'll do it. 
because you like the control that you have in your religiosity. You like the predictability of it all. I'm asking you tonight, you may be in the depths and the bottom of some dungeon in some foreign land. And all you need to say is, Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Meet me here, please. Come in. And from the basement to the pinnacle, to everyone in between, driving down the freeway at this moment, or maybe perhaps you are somewhere flying or walking or jogging on the treadmill at the health club. God is saying to you right now, open up your heart and let me come into your life. Time is up. The end is near. I'm coming back and you need me. My friend, he will respond. If only you would respond to his invitation. We're going to start this song, and as this song starts, I'm going to ask you to stand at will. But let's make this song a prayer to him in honor of such a beautiful high priest, our precious minister, who's in the tabernacle, the sanctuary of our eternal security. In Jesus' name.